All righty. Well, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Anna Sabino, and I am the Director of Young Adult Programs for the College Diabetes Network. Thank you all for joining us in this special event, um, specifically in partnership with CBDCE, and you guys will be hearing uh, more from them in a few minutes. Um, so if you are not already familiar, uh, CDN is a national nonprofit organization committed to providing young adults with the peer connections they value and the expert resources and support they need to successfully transition to adulthood and live full, healthy lives with diabetes. The engagement of all of you as our young adults um, after a very draining almost two years of Zoom classes and I'm sure online events really shows us that you're dedicated to your professional future. So thank you for choosing to spend tonight with CDN and learn more about what your path might look like as a future certified diabetes care and education specialist. We know that many of you are full of energy and interested in becoming this next generation of um, CDCESs. Um, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Cheryl Traficano, the CEO of the Certification Board for Diabetes Care and Education, and then um, Becky Sulek, who will be helping uh, moderating tonight's panel. Uh, one quick housekeeping note, um, we are going to be keeping everybody muted for this event and ask that you hold any questions uh, for our panelists live until about 10 minutes before the end of the program uh, because we will hopefully maybe get to some of those questions um, throughout the event. Thank you, Cheryl. Great, Great. thanks, Anna. Uh, and I wanna say thank you to CDN and thank you also to um, our wonderful CDCSs and Haley who's joining us tonight for our panel. So, and thank you everybody who's joining us. So this is going to be literally very short and sweet, but I think it will answer some questions. And then as our CDCSs talk about their journey, it may answer some more questions and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end too. So, all right. So next, and my name is Cheryl Traficano. I'm the CEO of the organization. Um, I'm not a health professional. I've been with the organization since 2000 and I've been CEO since um, 2013. So, and it's just been a real pleasure to work with all of our uh, CDCSs and people who are interested in becoming certified. It's such a passionate uh, group to be able to be a part of. So, so Anna, you wanna go to the next one? So just a reminder, we have been around, this is our 35th anniversary actually this year, um, but we were known as the National Certification Board for Diabetes Educators. And our credential was the Certified Diabetes Educator from 1986 up until 2019. And then we transitioned with the change in the specialty to its new designation of diabetes care and education specialist. So we changed the name of our organization and then we also changed the name of the credential. Next slide. So I'm sure you all know about this, but this is just a reminder. I don't need to talk to this audience. Diabetes, you know, is continuing to grow. And we definitely want people who are passionate and, you know, knowledgeable working with people with diabetes to help them reach the goals that they're interested in. So this is no news, but we always like to include that information. Next slide. And then again, this is not anything that this group doesn't know, but how important diabetes education is to self-management. Um, so we just always like to talk about that. And then we always like to talk about, I always try to include the joint position statement that talks about the four times that people should be um, getting education or working with their uh, diabetes care and education specialist. So we, we just try to spread the news and always include this information when we talk about um, what our folks are doing. Next slide. So we are going to talk about becoming a CDCS this evening. And, um, you know, I don't know how many of you have actually been able to work with one. Hopefully you have been able to do that when you wanted to do that. But the CDCS really serves as, you know, a mentor, a confidant, a cheerleader and a coach. Um, they're definitely valuable, you know, valuable and respected members of the healthcare team, and they definitely make a difference in the people with diabetes and in their communities. Next slide. So why would people want to become a CDCS? There's a number of different reasons. Um, obviously, it demonstrates to consumers or people with diabetes that you hold knowledge needed 
for quality care and education. It does help peers and then other members of the healthcare team know and recognize your role and your ability to contribute as a member of that team. Depending on where you're working, um, it could distinguish you in a competitive market. And then it really does give people opportunities outside of what they might normally do as far as professional and personal opportunities. And I think our panel will talk a little bit about that when they talk about the things that they are doing. Next slide. So why, again, why do people want to become a CDCS? Definitely when people are certified, they feel confident and they feel, feel fulfilled in their roles. Um, they definitely feel that the credential sets them apart from their peers. And it really doesn't um, feel like it enhances their credibility and it gives them confidence. And so then we also just wanted to tell you a little bit about what the, you know, what the um, demographics look like a little bit as far as the health professions go. So as of April of 2021, you can see we are mostly registered dietitian nutritionists and registered nurses, and that includes also advanced practice nurses. Um, and then our pharmacists are definitely coming up. Um, and then we do, we're multidisciplinary. So there's many other different credentials and then also degrees that theoretically could meet our eligibility requirements. And that makes up the 3% um, of the other demographics. Next slide. So this talks about our eligibility requirements for the standard pathway. So this is, we have a list of qualifying health professional um, licenses and registrations, and also it does include an advanced degree in social work under the standard pathway. And so you wanna achieve that first. And then because the certification really is, it's not entry to practice, it's really a specialty certification. So then you wanna make sure that you are practicing in the field and accruing the knowledge and the skills related to that field. So it's a two year general requirement. So that does not have to be diabetes focused, but it can be. And that two year time frame can be part time or full time. Um, then the diabetes requirement is really a thousand hours doing diabetes education with patients. That's within five years right now. And that's a bit of an adjustment because of COVID. We have extended the year. Um, it used to be a thousand hours in four years. So for the next couple of years, it's a thousand hours spread out over up to five years if you need it. And then you wanna have at least 200 of those hours in the last 12 months so that you make sure you have current experience close to the time that you're going to sit for the exam. And then the other component is some continuing education. So you wanna make sure that you have 15 hours, at least 15 hours of diabetes related CE within the two years before you apply to sit for the test. And you can be doing that two years and those thousand hours and that CE all at the same time, if you'd like, that's totally fine, or they can be separate. And then once you can document that you meet all of those requirements, then you apply and then you take the test. And then once you receive that passing score, then you hold that CDCS credential. Next slide. So we also do have a unique qualifications pathway. And that pathway is for individuals who don't hold one of our designated licenses or registrations in that standard pathway. Um, some common things are like a master's degree in exercise physiology or nutrition. Also public health is another one that people have used to um, pursue this pathway. So you have to get that degree first, and then you need to accrue experience just like you do in that standard pathway. It's still two years, but instead of 1,000 hours, it's actually 2,000 hours. And then for the continuing education, it's 30 hours of CE instead of the 15 hour, hours of CE. And we just kind of want to make a note that you really want to think about your ultimate goal if you're thinking of this as a potential pathway. Because the thing is that the CDCS credential doesn't expand anyone's scope of practice or the work that they can do under their qualifying degree or discipline. So you want to make sure that, I mean, if you really are interested in being a health professional and, and staying with that and being a CDCS, you may want to look at the idea of doing something in that standard pathway. Um, we have had people, it truly is supposed to be unique, so you're often, you've got that degree and you're actually, there's a place that's letting you do this, serve in this role. And the thing may be, if you then try to move to another position or to another go independent, you may not be able to do that under solely using that degree or discipline, depending what you have. So you just want to be careful and you want to make sure that you pick what's really going to meet your ultimate goals. Next slide. So this is just a link, I talked about it a little bit, but basically we have extended how long 
people can um, take to accrue the practice hours because we know that in a lot of places, diabetes education was not happening, especially in 2020. Um, even with some of the telehealth and things going on, not every place was able to do that. So we've extended to the five years, reduced how much you need for that current, uh, the, from the 400 to the 200 for current experience. Um, but if you link through to this PDF, then you can see the, whole, the sheet that explains all of that over the different timeframes. Next slide. So we do have some ways that the fee to apply for the examination is currently $350 and we don't have any plans on, on changing that or increasing that. But we do have some ways, we just launched a scholarship program in 2021 and that helps people cover the cost for the application. And so we have a number of different categories and we'll be doing this again in 2022. Um, so it's diversity and inclusion is one category, a young professional, if you're a veteran or you work with people who are in the military, profession expansion is for all of those qualifying license or professions outside of the dietitian, nutritionist and the nurse. So we're trying to bulk up and beef up and diversify that our disciplines as well as other areas. And then also if people work with people in underserved or under-resourced populations, we wanna support that. So the scholarship program covers the cost of that. It also covers the cost of, we do have a practice examination that's available. So someone can see exactly what it's kind of like to actually sit at that Carol and take that test. And so that scholarship program also um, allows you to do that as well. So if depending where you are in your uh, journey, you know, you keep your eye out for that scholarship information, which is on our website. Next slide. Awesome. Um, and then currently people take the exam by going to um, in-person test centers, uh, but we are launching remote live proctoring. And so that'll launch hopefully in early 2022. So we're excited to let people know that that's going to be an option and hopefully give people some different avenues if uh, in-person testing does not work for them. <laughs> Next slide. So this is just some information you can link through where it's information more about the exam, what exactly it's made up of. You can actually see the content outline, what can be covered on the examination. And then also we have some tips and hints and suggestions for people when they're getting ready to test. So if you link through this uh, slide it has a number of different links that you can go to to visit our website and learn more about preparing for the exam. Next slide. And this is how you reach us if you have questions. Um, and you know we have people answering the phones live, um, but you're welcome to email us or reach out to us by phone if you have questions you know, after this uh, conversation. And the last few slides are simply testimonials from CDCSs. I always like to share that with people so they can um, just hear what our CDCSs say about holding their credential. And I'm not going to read those, but you can read those in your leisure. And that literally is the short and sweet explanation for the certification program right now. And so I'm very happy to introduce Becky Sulik. And Becky is our uh, chair elect of the organization. She'll become chair in 2022. And Becky, take it away. Great. I'm so glad to have all of you here with us today. Um, I know the limitation of Zoom meetings is that I don't get to see you face to face necessarily, but I'm, I'm so happy to see the interest. Just a little bit about me. I am a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. And I have held the, that, this credential since uh, 1998. And I work in an endocrinology center in Idaho Falls, Idaho. I, um, have type one diabetes myself. And that really had influenced my desire to obtain uh, both the RDN and the CDCES credential because of the influence that uh, I had experienced from some positive uh, mentoring from, at the time the credential was the CDE, Certified Diabetes Educator, but my own Certified Diabetes Educator was so influential in helping me um, get through my rebellious teenage years with diabetes. So here I am. Anyway, I'd like to go ahead and start by asking our panelists to just give a little introduction as well. And I'm going to start with Persis. 
Persis, can you go ahead and uh, just uh, briefly introduce yourself and what your current role is in the diabetes community? Sure. Um, so my name is Persis Commissariat. I'm actually a pediatric psychologist at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. So I fell into that little 3% that Cheryl was showing in her graph. Um, I currently do both clinical work and research, and I have a pretty strong research interest in identity development in adolescents and young adults with type 1 diabetes, which is a place where my CDPS comes in really handy in providing the right education and support to help somebody really cope and accept their type 1 diabetes. Great. Thank you. Um, Anna, I think we decided to include your journey as well. So do you want to tell a little bit about yours? Sure. Thank you, Becky. Um, Semi-similar to Persis. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Anna Savino again. Um, I fall into that sort of 3% rare category where I have a um, master's in social work and then um, was able to have the opportunity to go on and work kind of part-time in a clinic uh, to get some of those hours and exposure and um, received my CDCES um, a couple of years ago. So I, I love working with young adults at, at CDN and providing a lot of the um, educational programs and um, opportunities for, for young adults. Thank you, Anna. I'd like to introduce Lorena Drago and uh, go ahead, Lorena, and tell us about your unique experience. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, I'm Lorena Drago. I do not live with diabetes or, or pre-diabetes. However, my journey with that, with diabetes, in the world of diabetes began when um, someone, I met someone who was a CDE at the time, Certified Diabetes Educator. And she told me it was the best career path um, that she had taken. And I was so curious about it. And she said it was the best thing that I ever did. So I said, and what do you have to do? And then she explained to me what she did. So then I realized that I had more and more uh, patients with diabetes. And I realized that in order for me to uh, serve them better, I needed to become a CDE. And that's what I did. And I cannot imagine myself doing anything else than working with persons and families of persons with diabetes. Thank you. Um, I'd really like to highlight too, I, I'd like to have Haley introduce herself. Hi, I'm Haley. Um, I've had type one diabetes since I was eight years old and I'm getting ready to graduate from the University of Kentucky with a dietetics degree because I'm on the pathway to become a certified diabetes care and education specialist. So I actually have recently worked with Lorena. She was my mentor and she is incredible. She has gave me lots of insight and knowledge on my pathway. So she's been very essential to me. <laughs> and Lorena, I'd love to, I'm just kind of skipping a couple questions here that I'll go back to, but Lorena, can you talk a little bit about your uh, experience in mentoring and, and um, how, what, yes. how you felt about that experience and what you gained sure, from it. Sure, So I, like I said, this has been a uh, great uh, career path and specialty, I should say for me, as a registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education special, uh, specialist. So one thing about this specialty is that many of us uh, are older, um, so one thing that I felt was very important is to work with, with students because uh, being a CDCES is a specialty. It's really not, um, we are a multidisciplinary group as Cheryl was explaining before. Therefore, I think it is vital 
to start working with students and um, persons who are younger in their professional life, whether they are psychologists, social workers, uh, dietitians, or nurses, and start talking to them about this specialty. So for me, it is, it is I would say, a great opportunity um, to work with students such as Haley and start letting them know there are so many different, different pathways that exist nowadays that you can start thinking about so many different things that you can do in your career. In this case, Haley is going to be graduating as a dietitian. She's going to sit down for the exam as a registered dietitian. So many times we think, well, the options may be, I am going to work in a clinic, I may be working in a hospital, but there are other choices that you can do. Can you um, work with food industry? Can you work creating content? Can you work with certain populations that you desire? So it's, it's about presenting all these different opportunities or creating your own that I wanted to make sure that Haley was aware of what is out there for her and for many of you who are listening to this. Thank you. Haley, and, can yeah. you tell us a little bit more about, uh, about just some of how the, the mentorship relationship has really broadened and, and maybe even changed a little bit your understanding of what the possibilities are? So I actually joined my CDN chapter at the University of Kentucky. I am currently the president and I applied for the Next Gen Fellowship through the College Diabetes Network. And I got the fellowship and Anna is actually the one that put me in touch with Lorena. So if it wasn't for CDN and the Next Gen Fellowship, I wouldn't have any of these opportunities. So I'm very thankful for CDN as well. Um, Lorena, she really made me think about things that I'd never thought about, even like coding and billing and the business side of being a diabetes educator. So just having someone lead you in that direction and let you think about things that you wouldn't normally think about, it's gave me a different perspective and it's allowed me to go ahead and work on those skills now so I can be more ready for that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was also felt like I was influenced heavily by mentors in, in making my decision to become a CDCES. And, and so I really appreciate those relationships. Persis, have you had any experience either being mentored yourself or mentoring the students and how that's impacted your choice to become a CDCES? You know, I, um, I am one of the Next Gen Fellowship mentors. Uh, I don't know that, I, I think I began as a mentor after I started the process of getting my CDCES. I'm actually relatively newly certified, um, just receiving my certification in December of last year. But in fact, the whole reason I even went for the certification is because I, I think I've told some of you before, um, I was very heavily influenced by actually a social worker who I used to see when I was a child um, because I, I think I might be one of the few people with type one diabetes who didn't have a supremely like supportive pediatric relationship. And so I, uh, I did meet with a social worker in my diabetes clinic who was really life-changing for me and was the only one who would comment on me as a person and my life outside of diabetes. And I, I'd never felt like a number with her. And it was that type of support that really drove me into the mental health field and, and always had that certification in the back of my mind because I knew I needed to be that same type of person for somebody else with diabetes. Great, thank you, thank you. Anna, what's been your experience with the, the mentor 
chip in, in your journey there? Yeah. Um, I, and I think I forgot to mention this, um, when I introduced myself, I was diagnosed, uh, six, uh, in kindergarten. So my parents, uh, sent me off pretty early on to diabetes camp. Um, and I think after becoming, um, a diabetes counselor and then kind of being very involved in the leadership programming there, I realized that, you know, not everyone, not every camper was coming to camp with the access to care and opportunities in their care team with that kind of, you know, holistic support where they need it, which ultimately drove me to pursue my degree in social work. Um, but I had a, uh, the camp director actually had her degree in social work. And so I sort of, I sort of realized that there were a very wide range of opportunities with that degree. And then the opportunity to then go deeper and further, knowing that diabetes is my ultimate passion, it was a natural fit. Um, and then, and I think that is really what continues to, to drive my like passion for working with all of the next gen fellows and staying connected into the community because I know that there are so many people who have this kind of similar passion to share um, from personal experience yet um, and we need all of you <laughs> on this call to to kind of give that back and and kind of follow Haley and and Persis and Lorena and their in their footsteps so I think even someone who's I guess entering like my mid-career everybody always has a, has a mentor and I look up to people like Lorena and the people who are, are in those roles now so I'd say mentorship is kind of ongoing. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask all the panelists this question so uh, what I would like to know and should have you share with everyone else here is what do you feel like is the most unique way that you're using your CDE CES credential today? What impact are you making? And um, I will start with, to give everyone time to think about that, but I, I feel like um, I'm making an impact in, in giving, I work a lot with the younger folks that have type 1 diabetes, and I feel like I'm giving them um, the understanding and the, I know where they're coming from, and I know when they're frustrated and when, they, when things aren't working and when they express to me things like, I believe it was Persis that said, feel like a number. And I, and I let them know that they're a person and that I care about them, not just their diabetes. So, Lorena, would you go next? I will go next. Um, I don't have, it's interesting because all of you have the personal experience of living with diabetes. Uh, and I don't. Um, however, I do have an autoimmune condition. So I bring that experience, which is of course not diabetes, um, but it does bring empathy. But because I have been a, a, a diabetes educator for um, decades, I think that I can, to a level, empathize with, with some of the frustrations. Um, and, uh, but what does bring me is the, the ability to understand um, the technology, to understand, I think, to a higher level, uh, more than many of my other colleagues that may know about nutrition, but because they are not in the immersed in the pool of diabetes, they may not be as up to date as I am in diabetes knowledge and management. So I think that that brings me a little bit of a cut above the rest. And when I am in, in the peer support communities 
and I hear about the day-to-day life about living with diabetes, that is very valuable to me to be involved in peer support because that I don't learn in conferences and I don't learn in the books. So when someone says, I am traveling and can someone give me some tips uh, about what is the best way to carry my insulin, that I am not going to find in the books, but I will hear from other people with diabetes. So then I take note because that I need as an educator so that I can relate that to other persons with diabetes. So that's the part about learning from other persons with diabetes and then learning from research and journals, et cetera. Thanks, Lorena. And I hope that you're okay if I also say that you are one of my go-to people on really understanding some of the different Hispanic cultures and the unique needs that they have, particularly in nutrition. I just wanted to point that out that I, I, I just recognize your extra you. knowledge and um, ability to help so many of us who are not immersed in that. Yes, so I, I guess it's the we all we all have to learn from from each other, and then I go to peer support communities to learn about people with diabetes. <laughs> so yes, so thank you. Yes, Persis, can I ask you to go next? Sure. Um, so I guess in talking about in talk in following up with really what Lorena said, I. Feel like having this certification was a really special and important way to take your experience with diabetes and turn it into something professional and like re really find benefit in something that you've lived with for so long and perhaps even struggled with but put that struggle to good use in helping other people and so I, I I've already said before that I realized I took a little bit of a unique pathway in getting this certification. Although I will tell you, Cheryl, I did not click the unique pathways. I just did the traditional one. <laughs> but um, I, I know that I am a little bit different in my area of expertise. And I think the way in which I actually use my CD, CDS that's a little bit different is I've used it, at, in fact, to help me with research as well as clinical work which I will tell you in, to my knowledge, I have not met many psychologists out there who have this credential. And the few that I have met are truly my heroes, like the most impressive people out there, in which case it gave me even more of a, a drive to go for this certification. And I find that having some of that background knowledge in learning theory or how to effectively support people or even utilizing some of the things Lorena said about taking lived experience. In taking that lived experience and translating it into research interventions, I find that I can be so much more effective than traditional behavioral researchers because I, I can see things like at the ground level, both from personal experience and from my clinical work. And I can translate that into something that I hope one day will become a bigger, better intervention that we'd be able to help people across the nation, across the world with. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, how about you? Um, I think semi-similarly to, to Persis, um, I am one of the very few that has a, a social work degree um, with this uh, credential, but I think the, the role that I play at CDN every day is, you know, working towards constantly listening to the needs and the voices of the young adults that are so needed. Um, especially as they're in such a vulnerable time in their life. And, you know, all of us at CDN um, and myself especially take, you know, every single piece of evaluation and apply it to creating meaningful programs that are long lasting and hopefully impactful for the next generation of 
certified diabetes care and education specialist. So it's, it's really kind of this unique opportunity to almost be a liaison between the, the young adult voice in some of the direct program, you know, support program, educational programming that we offer, then also, you know, working directly with our clinicians and, and relaying some of those voices back and forth. Um, that's, that's a real, it's a real treat to be able to transform on the ground um, to the people who need it the most. Thank you. Now, Haley, I know that you're not yet a certified diabetes care and education specialist, but what impact are you hoping to make in your career moving forward? Well, I know just from my personal experience, I have never really felt heard or felt like a person when I've been to a diabetes clinic. So I'm hoping to really connect with my patients, especially younger kids, and give them a place where they can be vulnerable and open and where they can know that it's okay if you're not 100 all the time because you're not gonna be. <laughs> so I just wanna give my patients a place where they can be open with me and come and seek the knowledge that they need. Thank you, thank you. Okay, uh, I'd like to ask all our panelists too, to what advice would you give to those here on the call today who are considering becoming certified? What would be your top advice? And run. So I'm gonna start with Lorena. <laughs> I would say run, no. <laughs> uh, run to become a CDCS. Um, I always say that every person who has been around me has been um, um, encouraged to become a CDCES, and most have. Uh, I don't know, I never have, never forced anyone, uh, but I think that I have been so enthusiastic about it that I think probably now about 10 of the dietitians that I have supervised have all become CDCES, including one that received her notification today. How nice. Yes. Great news, right? So oh, absolutely. <laughs> I was very happy to congratulate her on Instagram when she posted her letter with her little picture right there. So very happy. Thanks. Persis, what advice would you give to those considering this? I guess that I would say, assuming that most of the people in attendance already have the motivation to go forward on this path, I would encourage everyone to, to think about the pathways that you would take to get there. I, I in fact, will tell you, I didn't know the, the breakdown of CDCESs until Cheryl showed it right now. And so with the many, many opportunities out there, I feel like this is probably one more way to highlight who you are and diabetes is like diabetes is a part of you and this certification is this extra specialty that really just amplifies your skills and your knowledge and and ways to find benefit in your diabetes but don't lose that sense of self that you have like go forward on yeah. whatever healthcare or unique related path that you think really defines you thank you Anna, what advice would you give? Um, I think my advice would be to just never stop networking. Um, and I think networking can be anything, especially in this um, pandemic that's very virtual still world. You know, if you, like tonight, if you felt like uh, you wanted to connect with someone afterwards, send them a follow-up email. If you're at a conference, go up to the speaker and introduce themselves because I can't tell you the number of times, like, yes, it's nerve wracking, but like Lorena said, and, and Haley and all of us speaking about like, you know, this idea of, of mentorship, a mentorship, yes, it can be a formal aspect of a program, but it can be someone that could connect you to your dream job someday. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it never hurts to, to ask the question. Um, 
and it could open so many doors to a somewhere somewhere new. I love that. And um, one of my questions I had on here too was, is there any, uh, you know, Cheryl had mentioned that sometimes there's some unexpected opportunities that you get from earning the CDC yes credential is have any of you had any unexpected benefits that you hadn't counted on when you earned the credential and I'll just open it up to whoever wants to shout out on that one yes go ahead Lorraine mm -hmm. uh yes uh once I became a CDCS I joined ADCES uh, and I became very active in the organization. Um, once I became very active, uh, there was an opportunity um, with a company that was looking um, for a nutritionist. And I said, oh yes, I would love to learn a little bit more about that. And um, up until recently, just a few years ago, I had a working relationship with this company. It was a wonderful working relationship as a consultant. So it was um, for almost uh, 20 years that I had a relationship. And it was just because I was a CDCES. And... Um, that was true about many different uh, opportunities, uh, creating content uh, for, uh, for other organizations. Um, so there has been many, many different opportunities. Great. Any other thoughts any of the other panelists have about that? Okay. I just wanted to say in my role here at our clinic, we also are a clinical research site for many of the new diabetes technologies. And um, one of the unexpected benefits of having the CDCES is when companies come to our, our clinic to determine whether or not they're going to have us run, say, a sensor study or an insulin pump study and things like that. The fact that we have certified diabetes care and education specialists here helps us to get those um, studies at our clinic and then actually helps us to be involved. So the unexpected thing for me is just actually having been able to sort of experience some of this technology before they're available to the diabetes community in general. And that was not something I would have ever counted on having that experience when I set out on my journey to become a diabetes care and education specialist. Great. All right. Um, my last question for the panelists before we open up for questions is, if there's one thing that you could change or see change about diabetes care and education, what would it be? Okay. And I'm going to ask Haley first. Well, my hope, like I'd said, I didn't really feel like I got a good approach when I was younger. I felt like I was more shamed for what I was doing wrong rather than what I was doing right. And um, especially recently in my classes, I've learned a lot about motivational interviewing. So I think personally for me, I hope to use the motivational interviewing approach more towards children and not just children, I hope to use it with adults that I work with in the future as well. But I just want there to be a change where people with diabetes are more encouraged to have it out there, to live the life they want to live and not really feel like they're held back from anything. So. Great. Thank you. Persis, how do you feel about that? What's one thing you would change if you could about how diabetes care and education is done? I think I would want more of it. <laughs> I, I think I would not only want it to be more available to people, but would want it to happen more often. Um, I know Cheryl mentioned in her presentation those four key time points in which we're always told to provide diabetes care and education, which, you know, at diagnosis and complicating factors and things like that. But 
on top of that, I, I feel like especially for people who are growing with diabetes and likely hitting multiple transitions all at once, we should just make this standard of care, like along with mental health, of course, and I know that I'm very biased in saying that, but it should all be part of standard practice. Everybody needs that support, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, and we just need to normalize it and provide more opportunities for it for people so that they don't feel like they were sent to see a care and education specialist for shameful reasons. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Lorena, anything to add to that? I have two things to add. I think that, um, of course, I just need to add something about uh, culture. Um, I think that it is important when we're talking about nutrition to talk a little bit about more about cultural foods during, uh, the, during that nutrition piece. I think that many individuals feel that uh, their cultural foods are not good instead of how can they fit. So I would love to have more, more questions that, that sound something like, um, tell me more about some of your favorite cultural foods and for people to be able to say this, this and that. Uh, and for the clinician to say, tell me so, some more about your cultural foods so that we can talk about how we can include them in your diabetes plan. I would love to, to have one of those questions included. And uh, the other thing that I would love to see is, um, I think that all of the diabetes self-management and education topics are very important, just like Persis has said, um, but I think that they should be offered like a dictionary. And what I mean by that is we, when we use the dictionary, we don't need to memorize, start with the letter A and finish at the letter Z. When we use a dictionary, we go for the word that we need at that particular moment um, because that's what we need. And when it comes to diabetes care and education, especially when we have to attend those classes, we have to attend the class about acute complications, even though what we need may be something else. So I think that's when people get bored because it doesn't fit their needs and then they don't want to come to that class because what really matters at that time is teach me how to use the CGM. This is what matters at this time. I don't need to know about something else so people don't show. So what if we just taught what someone needs to know at the time, just like the dictionary, looking for the word that we need at the time. So I don't know how, but I think that that's the key to diabetes self-management and education. You can see why I like hanging out with all these guys, right? Because they're amazing. So she's so the reason <laughs> Just yeah. listen to her speak like she's awesome. <laughs> And the reason I asked that question, I just wanted to know that all you were on the call today that are considering, look at the type of impact and the changes that you could be involved in by, by considering um, this profession, this certification. And with that, I think we're at our point now where we can open up for questions. I'll turn it back over to Anna. I know there are lots and lots of questions or I, uh, all I will say is that I had so many questions and this is an amazing opportunity for you all to type them in um, and you can continue to ask us questions or Cheryl questions directly about the process. Um, yeah. 
very lucky to have uh, Cheryl, who is the CEO <laughs> of this, this organization right here. Um, I will say I was like overwhelmed at the process of going through an exam, but most of the time, this isn't the first exam that you end up taking. It's usually like you've already taken a nursing board or um, something else, but looks like we have a question. Is certification for life? Do you need to take refresher courses over time? Great question, Cheryl. That's yeah, exactly. That's a very good question, right? So Rachel, the certification cycle is for five years. So once you've become certified, it's a five-year time frame, and then you do need to renew if you want to keep the credential. And as long as you're still practicing in diabetes, which for actually for renewal covers a lot wider things that even under initial certification counts, as long as you're still practicing in diabetes, you can renew by documenting continuing education. So it's 75 hours of continuing ed over any time over that five-year cycle. So that's how that works. But yes, you do need to renew on a regular basis. And Cheryl, will you sort of briefly talk about, and I think many of us can too, how, how do you get those recertification CEs? Um, and and what, what counts towards that? I mean, I can answer that, but um, I would love <laughs> to hear from you. <laughs> right. So yeah, so because we're multidisciplinary, I mean, we have basically every major accrediting body or organization for all the different disciplines. Um, so as long as you take CE from those folks, then that's going to count. And we actually encourage people, you might want to take CE from like Anna as a, with social work, maybe she wants to take a pharmacy one if her meds, if she hasn't necessarily kept up with what's going on related to diabetes medications. So we actually encourage people to take CE from other disciplines and other organizations that focus on that to make sure that you're keeping up to date with current knowledge across the board. The other thing I will share with that is that Lorena mentioned an organization called ADCES. And once you become certified, this is the organization that um, stands for it's American Diabetes Care. Oh my gosh, why? Now I'm on the spot. For, Association yeah, for Association. Diabetes Care and Education. Um, so once you become certified, this is an organization that will start emailing you for life. And they um, <laughs> put on an annual conference where a lot of people get their hours that they need for the year and loads of online courses and, and opportunities and local events and programs to get connected with. Anybody, anybody else want to add anything? To I that? would encourage people to join that organization even before they become certified. Yes. I just yes. think it's got a, a lot of things that help. And I believe even as a student, you can join. So yes, I um, agree. I am a, a member of the organization and I am a volunteer um, of the association. I am the um, chair of the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee for the organization. So I'm very, very involved. So I just wanna um, just share that with everyone, but it is a great place to network. It is a great place to meet other health professionals of various discipline. And yes, I agree with Becky. Uh, you don't have to be as, um, certified diabetes care and education specialist in order to join. And um, there, it is a good place to, to take uh, webinars and courses. You can even visit, go online, download. Um, there are some free handouts that you can use. Um, so it's a great place to, um, air quotes, uh, hang out and, uh, and meet other diabetes educators and connect. Right. And thank and you, Lorena. Just, sorry. Oh, and I just want to say, um, yeah, I mean, so we're, you know, CBDC is the certifying body, but mm -hmm. ADCS is really, they support the whole profession, the Correct. whole specialty. And we feel, you know, as a certifying board, we strongly encourage people to be members of ADCES or American Diabetes Association, because really that's, you know, that's, they're supporting the profession. So yes. we strongly encourage people to be members. There's so many benefits and, you know, things that make sense 
if that's your specialty that you want to be a member of the ADCS. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We have four minutes and like <laughs> six amazing questions to tackle. Um, very quickly, can one person answer the question about the supervision and sign off on, on hours obtained? Uh, so this is Cheryl. I'll take that one. So when you um, basically just talk with your supervisor, ask them what they would need to have from you in case you got audited. Basically, when you apply for certification, you're just going to say, I've done this and we're basically going to believe you. We just do have a random audit process. Mm -hmm. And if you get chosen for audit, then your supervisor is going to have to be able to say, yes, this person had however many hours over this time frame. So have a conversation with your supervisor. You know, do they need an Excel sheet? Do they need to just know that you, you know, you guys agree you're doing 20 hours a week of diabetes education? So just have that conversation up front. But when you apply, there's nothing that you need to document or send unless you're um, chosen for audit. Perfect. Okay. Persis, I'm going to let you take this one because I am, um, you can talk. I'm, I'm sick of talking. <laughs> but for someone who's in um, an LCSW looking for advice on, on studying with the medical stuff, definitely those type two drugs are, are the hardest to memorize, but you took the exam more recently than me. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in fact, right before taking the exam, I was texting Anna constantly like, <laughs> <laughs> I also deal almost exclusively with type one diabetes. So a lot of those things like, feel right. um, I think in terms of studying, what was most useful for me was I went onto ADCES's website and I downloaded some of the study guides. Um, and I don't recall if it was Cheryl, maybe you could tell me if it was uh, CBDC that had this, but the sample test questions mm -hmm. those as well. I, I had ordered a gigantic textbook that I tried to study from, but I'm quite old now. Like I am no longer, I'm so far back. <laughs> I couldn't remember how to study. And <laughs> I ended up actually taking an online course. Um, and I, I believe it was Diabetes Education Services, which I, th I think is just run by a nurse who also happens to have a CDCES, but it was quite helpful for me to at least have it in that modality to like listen to a lecture and take some sample questions and things like that. And that was very useful for me and just familiarizing myself. And that um, that is a course that you may have to pay for, I believe. I don't think they offer any scholarships, but was very useful in just wrapping my head around some really brand new concepts that I hadn't known before. Um, that being said, I obviously like can't give away too much, but I will say I was quite shocked when I actually took the exam because after spending weeks and weeks memorizing <laughs> patients, um, my exam was like 90% learning theory. And I was like, mm -hmm. At. I'm a psychologist, <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little just, uh, just. I think this is Cheryl. One of the big things is really do look at that exam content outline that we have. I think that's, you know, and, and think about what you do from day to day and what you don't do. And so if there's a lot of questions in an area where you don't do something from day to day, you are going to want to try and find something for yourself. And it could be a simple CE course. It could be a review course. I mean, we just always say, make sure that review course is really going to cover what you need. Don't have, you know, like there's some very extensive ones. And if you are working in it and doing it, you may not need that. And it might, you might be spending time and money that you could be spending studying some other things that might make more sense. So really do look at that exam content outline that we have. So that, you know, do sort of a self-assessment. Perfect, perfect, okay. We're gonna do as fast as we can. <laughs> um, th but this is an interesting question um, and they're sort of combined. A couple of questions about, can you start the process before the, the BSN program? Um, and then a question about, you know, physician assistants and, and, and MDs. Right, so you do, you can't count, you know, you can't start accruing experience until you meet that first requirement. So you have to have that RN or that RDN. So you do have to do that first before you can start accruing hours. Of course, you can start accruing knowledge before that, but it really to for certification, it has to be after you meet that first requirement. 
Um, and then I think one of the other questions was about specific jobs to apply to, and there aren't specific jobs. You want to find a job where you're doing diabetes care and education, you know, and it could be that it's not all of your job. It's part of your job. But as soon as you can start counting and accruing hours, just start doing that. Um, I think I see another question was about uh, do PAs and MDs typically become CDCSs? Um, and they are on the smaller number. We're really trying to reach out more to PAs to see, you know, you know, get more interest in them for becoming certified. We know there's a big group of those folks out there. So we hope to have more of those, um, more PAs. Uh, MDs, again, not as many. Um, those, yeah, it's RNs and RDNs are the biggest chunk of folks right now. And of course, we'd love to expand that. We want definitely more people with mental health, behavioral health. We know that is so important. So we're looking forward to like trying to identify and you know, increase uh, people who are in those roles because it's so important. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see, next one I see, let's see. I think this one's really interesting. Um, you know, for, for those who have kind of almost, this would be a new like mid-career addition um, right. to a degree they already have, um, you know, how, how do people kind of jump back in um, if this is a new a new thing? Right. It really depends. I mean, but I keep saying, I mean, you know, nursing is still one thing you can get into with an associate's degree. So depending how fast you really want to get into it and what you're interested in, nursing can be one of the fastest ways and potentially least expensive. Yes, you can probably go get another master's degree also, but those are often quite expensive. So depending what you want to do, that is one avenue you can look at. I mean, even with an associate's, I mean, an associate's in nursing and a bachelor BSN, they both take the same licensure exam. You become an RN after you pass that exam. So that's one avenue you can take a look at if you really want to get in quickly. And then, of course, you can always go for your BSN after, you know, you get your associate's degree and you're sort of in the healthcare field. But that is one I would say that's probably the fastest way to jump in and the, as far as, and then when you look at cost, probably, so. I would also say that if you're in kind of a mid-career, maybe you already have the degree requirement or the licensing requirement, but you, maybe you're wondering about hours, how can I get hours? Check out CBDCE's mentorship program because that is a way that you can hook up with someone and help get some of the hours that you might need. So just, I won't, belabors talking too much right. about that, but check it out if you're in that boat. Awesome. I want to make sure we didn't miss anything to, but I think we got everything. Um, Belle, I think we hopefully answered your question. It's great to see you. Um, these are awesome questions and very, very valid. Um, I do want to be mindful of time. I know we're a couple minutes over, but I really just wanted to, on behalf of CDN and everything that we love to represent in terms of elevating that voice of young adults and, and really empowering them to use their experience and knowledge to move in to become the next generation of of, di of diabetes care and education in the future. Um, really thanks CBDCE for everything that you do and for, for loving that we have <laughs> the opportunity to, to offer these programs to, to really educate and empower this, this young adult crew. I know I wish I had something like this when I was studying or considering the different options. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, and like uh, someone said in the chat, uh, we are recording this presentation. We will be sharing it with you all tomorrow along with contact information um, and a couple of links for follow-up um, and a really, really quick evaluation. Um, so we can hopefully continue to offer these programs to, um, to more and more people interested. So, um, a huge thank you to Cheryl and to Becky and to all of our panelists. Um, anything else to add, Cheryl? No, I just want to say thank you, you know, panelists. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for spending time doing this. And it's great that we have the group out there, you know, interested in becoming certified. It's awesome. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. And we need you all.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Anna. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.